investigative techniques, but there is no room for walking guns. This goes against everything we are taught at ATF, and I hope the committee gets to the bottom of these allegations. In Mexico, ATF has been doing great work, and I am proud of our efforts in combating violent crime with our Mexican counterparts. The whole point of law enforcement mission in Mexico is to liaise with Mexican government officials and support their efforts to combat the transnational organized crime that plagues both our countries and threatens the security of our people. These allegations stemming from this case that a few ATF agents and supervisors deliberately allowed guns to walk have destroyed ATF's credibility with our Mexican law enforcement partners and the Mexican public. As this committee knows, Mexico is plagued by terrible violence. Time and again, my Mexican counterparts blame the United States for contributing to that violence. But paramount to ATF, they blame us for an uncontrolled flow of weapons that end up in the hands of Mexican criminals. I do not endorse the view of the Mexican government that American indifference is responsible for, vi for the violence and deaths. I make mention of it because it is what I hear on a daily basis in my dealings with my Mexican colleagues. However, in this particular case, with these specific guns, I am unable to defend this position. This case has made my life more difficult for me personally. Imagine my shame <clears throat> when my mother called me on the telephone and said, please tell me you weren't involved in this. My mother is a very wise person. She may, not know how much law, she may not know much about law enforcement, but she knows right from wrong. Even at great risk, uh, even at great distance, she could see that walking guns was a terrible risk. The public safety must always come first. Please remember, regardless of good intentions, walking guns will never be right. The ATF rank and file know this, and we have not been given a satisfactory explanation for what happened. So what I would like to say to my ATF colleagues is <clears throat> simply this. Stand tall. Hold your heads high. We work for a great agency. Look around, because there are heroes at ATF. We do not quit. We will not lie down. We will continue to honor our commitment to each other and to the public. I thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions the committee may have of me. Thank you. Mr. Ledman. Good morning, Chairman Eisen, Ranking Member Cummings, and designated, excuse me, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Lauren Ledman, and I am honored that you have summoned me here today to serve as a witness for the citizens of the United States. I am an intelligence operations specialist with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives and a law enforcement veteran with 40 years of dedicated service. I am appearing before you today with a heavy heart, laden with sorrow, to provide this committee with testimony that I hope will prove to be useful. First, I would like to express my grief by extending a sincere apology on behalf of myself and like-minded ATF colleagues to the family of Border Patrol agent Brian Terry. Likewise, I offer an apology to all Mexican law enforcement officers and military personnel placed in harm's way while confronting the violent criminals armed by the targets and their associates in the Fast and Furious investigation. I started my employment with ATF in December 2004 in the Office of Strategic Intelligence and Information. I was designated to support ATF's Project Gunrunner from the inception of the initiative in April 2005. In July of 2008, I became the team leader of the newly established Field Intelligence Support Team for the Southwest Border. The team works in partnership daily with OSII personnel assigned to the El Paso Intelligence Center and ATF personnel working in Mexico. Each of the partners work towards a common goal to determine the location and circumstances surrounding firearms recovered throughout Mexico identifying the criminal element associated with the firearms, collecting intelligence pertaining to the criminal elements, and ensuring that the firearms are traced. The team coordinates the information with case agents and field intelligence group. A major function of the team is to identify the firearms trafficking tens and patterns and to establish links between firearms trafficking cases and seizure events in Mexico. The team is dedicated to ATF's strategic mission as set forth in the 2007 Project Gun Runner Southwest Border Initiative report that is summarized as follows. Working with its domestic and international law enforcement partners, ATF will deny the tools of the trade 
to the firearms trafficking infrastructure of the criminal organizations operating in Mexico through proactive enforcement of its jurisdictional areas in the affected border states in the domestic front, as well as through assistance and cooperative interaction with the Mexican authorities in their fight to effectively deal with the increased violent crime. The report is, uh, had the following uh, strategic outcome. Suppression of the firearms and explosives related violence occurring on both sides of the border through effective law enforcement collaboration involving the focused training, investigation, and interdiction of the illicit trafficking and illegal use of firearms, explosives, and ammunition. The um, Southwest Border Team first learned of the Fast and Furious investigation on November 20, 2009. I had located the seizure event in Sonora. The Mexican authorities had recovered 42 guns from two transporters in a vehicle that just crossed the border from Arizona. With the assistance of the U.S. Uh, Immigration Customs Enforcement, I was able to obtain the information on the firearms, submit traces, and, and uh, the results of the ascertain the results of the investigation. Uh, from those firearms, uh, there was 37 that uh, related back to the Fast and Furious investigation, and the information, this information became the foundation for the fact that all the firearms contained in, in the Operation Fast and Furious investigation were potential crime guns and murder weapons predestined to be utilized by outlaws and assassins affiliated with a violent criminal organization in Mexico. In the months leading up to the, uh, February 2010, the Fast and Furious purchasers were buying the types of firearms preferred by a uh, drug trafficking organization in record numbers. By this time, they had purchased over 1,000 firearms, and some of the purchasers uh, were procuring them at a, lots of 10 to 20 at a time. At the same time, approximately 200 firearms in this investigation were recovered in the United States and Mexico. The types of firearms and the volumes of the purchases, the seizures and circumstances surrounding the seizures, along with the information provided by our law enforcement partners, fully corroborated the fact that these firearms were being acquired by a, fi a violent criminal organization in Mexico. In December 2009, I began uh, to the beginning of March 2010, I conducted numerous briefings on the investigation with the ATF senior management staff and headquarters. During each briefing, I provided detailed information depicting the prog progression of the acquisition of firearms and described the location, number, type, and identity of the purchaser for each firearm recovered. I provided the briefing to acting director, the acting director in the first part of 2009 concerning firearms trafficking to Mexico, in which he was briefed on the upstart of the Fast and Furious investigation. He later attended one of the field operations briefing in the first part of January. In March 2010, I conducted a video conference briefing with the managing officials from the four ATF border divisions, an attorney from the Department of Justice, and every one of the ATF senior management staff except for the acting director. With the assistance of the group supervisor in the charge of the Fast and Furious investigation, I provided a briefing outlining the amount of firearms purchased and the expenditures up to the end of February, along with the number of firearms seized and seizure locations. The totals briefed were the same as previously stated here. The issue of the firearms not being seized by the case agents was brought up briefly and discussed. Um, from this if point you could, on, if you could summarize the rest that we placed in the record. Right, so basically, what we're talking about is, by the end of it, we had the 2,000 guns. To date, there's about 590 that's uh, been recovered, 363 in the uh, United States, uh, 227 in Mexico, and they're still coming. Um, I would just like to say um, at the end here, the strategy of the Fast and Furious investigation did not take into account the public safety of the citizens of the United States and Mexico and blindly concentrated only on the goal of the investigation. The blatant disregard for public safety has had a tragic consequences that will continue in the unforeseen future. In the rest of my testimony, you can see. I thank you very much. Special Agent Newell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Issa, Representative Cummings, and distinguished members of the committee, I am William Newell of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. As the former Special Agent in charge of the Bureau's Phoenix Field Division from June 2006 to May of this year, I oversaw ETF operations in the states of Arizona and New Mexico, which includes 552 miles of the U.S.-Mexico border. 
I appear before you today to discuss ATF's Operation Fast and Furious, an ongoing and active OSADEF strike force investigation of a large-scale firearms trafficking organization. For the past 23 years, I have fully dedicated myself to confronting violent crime, especially firearms-related violent crime along the Southwest border. Having served 15, 15 of these years along the Southwest border combating firearms trafficking, I am keenly aware that this violence, fueled largely by Mexico's drug cartels, poses a serious challenge for U.S. law enforcement, U.S. and Mexican law enforcement, and threatens the safety of innocent civilians and law enforcement personnel on both sides of the border. At the conclusion of every investigation of this magnitude, a thorough review is appropriate in order to determine whether tactics, whether changes in tactics and strategy are in order. With that in mind, I recognize that in this case and future large-scale investigations, it is imperative that there exists an effective flow of information between the field and headquarters elements to ensure that critical investigative information is being shared timely. Second, in retrospect, in a case of this magnitude, it is incumbent upon me to communicate a greater sense of urgency to my staff and the U.S. Attorney's Office as to the need for the return of expeditious charges. Finally, I now recognize that in these types of investigations, more frequent risk assessments would be prudent. Firearms trafficking investigations are not always easy to conduct for a variety of reasons, including the lack of, federal, of a Federal statute that specifically prohibits uh, firearms trafficking-related activity, the fact that firearms, unless altered in some way, are not in, a, in of themselves contraband, the lack of adequate punishment for straw purchasers, thus impacting our ability to identify the leadership of the criminal organization and the limited resources at our disposal. These types of investigations are made even more challenging when none of the individuals in the firearms trafficking chain are presumptively prohibited by law possessing firearms. Consequently, in order to identify and investigate the responsible higher level individuals, agents must use a wide variety of investigative techniques. This can take time and considerable effort. Throughout this case, conscientious and dedicated agents pursued numerous leads in order to determine who the decision makers of this organization were in an effort to get beyond the straw purchasers and thus potentially disrupt and dismantle the entire organization. Through experience, we have learned that the arrest and prosecution of straw purchasers alone does little to frustrate the capacity of the Mexican cartels to continuously obtain firearms as new straw purchasers are easily recruited to replace those arrested and continue the cycle of purchasing firearms. Finally, our conduct of this investigation, as with any large-scale OSDEF investigation, was coordinated with ATF supervisor at headquarters in Washington, D.C., and with Federal firearms prosecutors at the Phoenix United States Attorney's Office. In October of 2009, the Department of Justice proposed a southwest border strategy to combat Mexican cartels, which was finalized in January of 2010, and which outlined successful strategies related to the identification, disruption, and dismantlement of Mexican cartels through comprehensive, multi-agency criminal enforcement operations with an emphasis on impacting the leadership and command structure of such organizations in order to have a substantial and sustained impact. The DOJ strategy recognizes, recognized that ineffectiveness, the, recognized the ineffectiveness of merely interdicting weapons absent identifying and eliminating the sources and networks responsible for transporting them. It was with this guidance in mind that Operation Fast and Furious originated. To be clear, Fast and Furious was a no-step operation designed to, one, identify the purchasers, financers, transporters, and decision makers in a Mexican cartel-based firearms trafficking organization, two, to interdict when lawfully possible firearms presumptively destined for Mexico, three, to share when appropriate relevant information with U.S. and Mexican law enforcement authorities, four, to develop intelligence on, for, on other firearms trafficking organizations, and five, to charge, arrest, and dismantle the entire organization. In this regard, there are some key points I would like to make. One, it was not the purpose of the investigation to permit the transportation of firearms into Mexico, and to the best of my knowledge, none of the suspects in this case was ever witnessed by agents crossing the border with firearms. Two, our agents, in compliance with ATF policy, were engaged in a strategic effort to determine who the decision makers and actual purchasers of the firearms were in order to disrupt the entire criminal organization. The effectiveness of this strategy has been recognized.